Okay, so herself sent me to the butchers this morning under strict instructions to get a ham and a... What do you call it? Jesus. Turkey. A ham and a turkey for Christmas. Okay, so happy days. Went in, got it, sorted. They're in the boot of the car, but the problem is... I have to go and meet a mate of mine, past guest in front of the show, Pat O'Reilly. We're going for a 10k run, and then uh, I can go home and I can uh, put the stuff in the freezer. Okay, all's well. But the problem is, I have two hours before Pat is ready. It's going to take us the best part of an hour to go around. So we're talking three plus hours before I can get this meat into the fridge. Now, luckily enough, it's four and a half degrees outside. I know that because it comes up on the dash of the car. Now, what I want to talk to about, what I want to talk about here is relativity things that are relevant and it's the it's the crucial component of analogies i think now again i'm, I'm just figuring this stuff kind of out as i go along but i think i've found what's the key to analogies generally and my use of them and what i find beneficial about them and what it is is and i've kind of touched on this before a couple of times i think that you need to have some sort of a grounding in something before you can understand something else Okay, so before you can learn something new, you need to have a grounding in something that's in some way comparable to the new thing that you're going to learn. Because if the new thing is completely, totally and utterly new to you and there's nothing remotely similar to it, the odds of you being able to understand it are slim, to put it mildly. Okay, so getting back to temperature, like temperature is just a measurement. I've done measurement a few times now and this is just an extension of that only with temperature. So it's four and a half degrees celsius on the dash of my car but what does that mean okay so if you know that the freezing point of water is zero degrees celsius you might say to yourself well if water freezes at zero degrees four and a half degrees isn't that far away from zero degrees so i'm going to guess that four and a half degrees isn't warm it's probably going to be pretty cold okay so if you know that even if you just know that that's some sort of a benchmark. Now, I've got a better one for you. Your fridge at home is most likely set to 5 degrees Celsius. It might be 4 degrees, it might be 6 degrees, but generally speaking, it's 5 degrees. That's typically the temperature that we refrigerate our food at. It's not so cold that it, that it either freezes or starts to freeze, and it's not so warm that it'll start to decompose as though it was out in the on your kitchen table. Okay, so that's a good example of how you can use a known thing. So if you can just wrap your head around the idea that everyone's fridge is set at five degrees, then you're going to know that if it's seven degrees outside or three degrees outside, that it's going to be fucking cold. Okay, so I was worrying about putting the, the meat in the car for a couple of hours. I didn't want it to, I didn't want to spoil it. Like I, I, I'm not familiar with how long meat can be taken out of a fridge and left out and be okay before it's frozen again. You know, you err on the side of caution in relation to poisoning your family on Christmas day. But anyway, I know that a fridge is at five degrees. So if it's four and a half degrees now, it's going to be four and a half degrees in my, in the boot of my car. So technically, I would have taken the meat out of the butchers, which would have been refrigerated at 5 degrees, put it in the boot of my car, and it's probably getting colder in the boot of my car than it would be if I had left it where it was in the fridge in the butchers. Okay? But it's not just temperature that this is, um, where this is relative, pardon the pun. This has massive benefit everywhere in explaining anything. If, you can, if you're trying to explain something to somebody, what you need to find is something that's comparable to what you're trying to explain that the person already kind of knows or has some form of grounding in. So, for example, if I was to tell you that my house was 30 feet tall. Now, if you don't know what 30 feet looks like, you're going to struggle knowing how high my house is. But you might say to yourself, well, I'm six foot tall, so if I stood on my head, and then I stood on my head again, and then I stood on my head again, and then I stood on my head again, that would be 30 feet, because five times my height is five times six foot, five times six is 30, so 30 foot. You'd have some view if you stood in your head six times, or five, if you stood in your head five times, because the first one is on the ground, but anyway... Imagine the view you'd have if you were six foot tall and five people stood on your head that were also six foot tall. That gives you some idea for the height of my house. Now, I've no idea what the fucking height of my house is. It's probably not 30 foot tall now that I think of it. Maybe the tip of the chimney is. But anyway, 
The point being, it's crucially important to have a grounding in something. And that's the beauty of analogy. That's why analogies work. Because if you, you, you can't explain something via analogy. You can't explain something that somebody doesn't understand with an analogy of something else they don't understand. You have to have that comparison. You have to have a solid grounding in something. So for example, for, bleh, another example, there is an oil tanker. I don't know if it's the biggest in the world, but it's certainly up there. So there's an oil tanker called Knock Nevis. Okay, the Knock Nevis oil tanker. Now I could tell you that it's 438 meters long, but odds are you're not going to have a fucking notion how long that is. Now, maybe you're a, you're, maybe you're a smart hearer and you say, well, there's a thousand meters in a kilometer. 438 isn't far off 500 so it's half a kilometer long fuck that's big that's big but then again if you don't have something in your head that tells you what a kilometer is i do i personally do i'm lucky the shop down the road from me i know it's a kilometer away so if somebody tells me that something is two kilometers long what i'll say to myself is fuck it's from my house to the shop doubled so I have a grounding. I know what a kilometer. I know that I have some reference point. Okay, it's relative to me. I can wrap my head around it. But again, if you don't have a, an idea of how long a kilometer is, maybe you have some idea of how big the Empire State Building is, because the Empire State Building is four hundred and fifty meters. So this ship that I'm talking about, the Knock Nevis, is the same fucking size as a skyscraper. That's how big these things are. But again, the the point that's got nothing to do with Knock Nevis or empire state buildings or fucking anything else the point that i'm trying to hammer home is just the importance of having some grounding in something before you try and understand something else so i've written down a couple here that i just think are are useful you've probably heard of the aztecs the aztecs that ancient civilization that we learned about in school everybody's heard of the aztecs and we all i think have it in our head that it was this somewhat prehistoric group of people that lived over in um, South America, or I think it was more um, Mexico, but anyway, over in, the, over in the Americas. The Aztecs, you know, most people have it in their head that it's probably thousands of years ago. Here's one for you. You know Oxford University in the UK? Oxford, that real hobnobby university? The date that that place opened is suspect. Nobody really knows, okay? From as far back, it's we know that people were teaching there as far back as the 1100s, but we know that there was a full-blown university there in the 1300s. We know that for a fact, okay? The Aztecs, their civilization started in the 1300s. Okay, it's the Aztecs, those that ancient civilization that you've heard so much about, they only started when that Oxford University in England started. And again, the reason that I'm explaining saying this is it kind of puts it into context like they couldn't be that fucking old and they're not if they're if you're only as old as a university in the uk you're not thousands of years old by a long shot here's another one for you that i've got this one blew me away now when i found it out you know the guillotine that um death penalty basically um apparatus basically a scaffold a wooden scaffold you pulled a rope on some sort of a pulley, it lifted up a huge big steel blade, you let go of the blade, or you let go of the rope that was holding the blade up, down comes the blade, off with his head into a fucking wicker basket or whatever, okay? Popularised in France and used throughout France his, French history, blah, blah, blah. But when was the last person executed? Have a think about that. When do you think the last person had their head chopped off as a as an execution in France, not you know some lunatic madman that fucking made one in his bedroom and caught someone and put them into it, an official guillotining by the state of a human being. Okay, it was in 1977. Now again, that that date, 1977, that mightn't mean anything to you, but if you can put it into context for people, if you can give them something to kind of some, if you can give them something that will give them a bit of a grounding in it, here's one for you. Do you know what else happened in 1977? You could go to the cinema and watch Star Wars. That's how recent it was. Okay, now for me personally, if I had heard 1977, I would have had to go, 1977 is pretty much 1980. There's 20 years to 2000. It's 2020 now, so 20 plus 20 is 40. It's 43 years ago. 
but that doesn't really mean anything to me even that it's relatively recent it's probably more recent than i would have guessed when the last guillotining was but to hear that star wars was in the fucking movie was in the cinema i mean like you could go and see star wars and get popcorn and a fucking drink of coke like it just puts it into perspective okay so i'm back sorry that if the sound is skipped a bit i had to stop the recording earlier Go do me 10k run with Mr. Riley and get back. I'm fucking back. Pat O'Reilly is an absolute animal. He's after dragging me around 10k in 47 minutes and 55 seconds, which, if it's not a lifetime personal best, it's not fucking far off. I'm still trying to catch me back. But anyway, I have to get this done, get this up, and move on with me there. The other uh, rule of thumb that I have is for 50 meters, just where we're on having a grounding. My understanding, and again, I fucking should have double checked this, but here we go. My understanding is that telegraph poles are typically 50 meters apart. So if you've ever a need to figure out what's 25 meters or 75 meters or 40 meters or 100 meters or whatever, or you're, you're asked to guess the length of a fucking field or something, I don't know, if you can guess it in where you think telegraph poles would go, because we all have a vague idea. We know they're not, you know, you can't touch one and the other one. You know, they're not that fucking close, but they're not two miles apart either because the wire has to fucking go from one end to the other without drooping down to the ground and without being so taut that it pulls the two of them together. So 50 metres as a general rule of thumb is, is my understanding at least, is the difference be is the distance between telegraph bolts. It's 11 minutes and 30 seconds, which is a little bit shorter than usual, but I might be able to drag it on by explaining what fucking happened to the previous recording I made today. You know the way you press save at the end of doing something? Well, I decided to press discard instead of save. So I had this done already. So this is my second hunting podcast of the day. Only I deleted the first one. But anyway, such is life. Lads, I'll chat you tomorrow. But before I let you go, I'd just like to remind everybody that this episode and all the episodes on YouTube have been brought to you by past guest and friend of the show, Pat McKeown. Pat is very similar to myself insofar as that he's long had an interest in the mind and more specifically the brain and how they both interact to such an extent that he went and spent four years getting a degree in neuroscience and then spent a further year in getting a master's in psychology. Now what he's done is pretty fucking cool. He's after setting up his own YouTube channel. It's called Pat Psychology Masters and there's a link in the description. Now what he's done here is he's uploaded all the best bits that he's learned over the last five years and put them into short, plain English, easy to understand YouTube videos for the likes of myself. His YouTube channel has been a massive resource for me in understanding both my mind and the mind of others. So hit up Pat Psychology Masters YouTube channel, subscribe, give it a like and a comment and a share all that kind of stuff helps and I'll chat you soon.